Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. My name is Seth Hoffman, and I am honored to present to you front edge research concerning the vibrational communication in the Atlantic mudskipper Periothalmus barbarus with the help of two very extraordinary acoustic researchers, Dr. Michael Smith and Dr. John Luca Polgar. So the idea of acoustic communication in the fish context, especially teleos fish species, is not a new one. There are many great research articles out there describing the sound production mechanisms and the variety therein. A really good example of one of these organisms that produces a variety of sounds with different mechanisms would be the catfish. Over here on the left, we see the striation of the pectoral spine that produces a pulse-like train. And on the right, a very commonly described and well-known swim bladder drumation commonly used in many different fish species. So there's a lot of different mechanisms out there for sound production and propagation. And a lot, and therefore there will also be a lot of mechanisms in receiving these sounds. If these species can produce these sounds, it's intuitive to assume and declare that these same species will be able to pick up these frequencies that are being produced. Otherwise, why would they make them? And that's the topic for today's discussion. A good example of that abstract would be the family of fish known as goby day, very commonly and diverse group of fishes. The mudskipper Periothalmodon septum radiatus has been known from previous research to communicate vibrations while out of the water, which is a really cool thing when you think about fish. Usually they're specialized in their sound production to produce sounds underwater, but when it comes to the goby day family, they are hybrids in what they call home. They're semi-terrestrial fish that live a lifestyle outside of the water. So therefore they must be able to communicate in some way through substrate rather than water. And in the context of this mechanism, we are looking at Periothalmus barbarus to see if this vibration communication is also prevalent and what that looks like as far as mechanism and as far as behavioral context. So this leads us to take advantage of one of the most prominent characteristics of the Atlantic mudskipper, which would be its territorial attitude. These fish are extremely territorial, so it's intuitive to conclude that most of their communication, most of their vibrations that they produce will be during disputes over territory, these dyadic contests. And so the design of this experiment is to propagate those sounds and induce those territorial disputes inside of an experimental tank pictured over here on the left and on the right hand side of the slide we see an overhead schematic of this same tank this is where the contest will be held this is where the vibrations will be picked up by these buried sensors we'll get into the specifics here so before each contest was held total length standard length mass and sex of the fish were recorded for behavioral context in order pr to predict who would win and what kind of behaviors would be exhibited. And so to start out the contest, a resident was acclimated and introduced into a tank for at least three days in which they would set up their territory. Once this was accomplished, then another fish, the intruder, would be introduced into the contest area closed off by a gate. The resident would then take interest in the intruder and want to induce a contest, a territorial dispute. The gate was lifted to the contest area. The intruder is allowed to enter and to interact with the intruder. During these contests, a lot of communication, a lot of vibration is being produced to the substrate, which is being recorded by those buried sensors showed on the previous slide. Each fish was given an opportunity to act as an intruder and a resident and both sexes were used. We had seven males and we had five females and their size varied from 59 centimeters to 13 centimeters in total length. So we had a lot of different combinations for these observations. And subsequent to the videos and dyadic contests being held came the bioacoustic analysis of the vibrations that we ended up collecting from these contests. They were organized into call type, frequency, and behavioral context through a system of software called Audacity. Peak frequency and duration were recorded, and each call, each vibration was categorized in one of three groups, which were grunts, pulse trains, and tones. 
So leading into the results, we wanted to first look at contest outcome and how size plays a factor and how role plays a factor into the outcome. So considerably intruders are at a disadvantage. It's not their territory and considerably small opponents in a contest are at a disadvantage as far as physicality. So we're looking at the balance between those two. And we found that intruders only won and made vibrations and calls when they were at equal or larger size relative to the resident. So if you had a resident and it was larger than the, than the intruder, it did not lose. If you had an intruder, it was possible for that intruder to win, but it always had to be at a larger size than the resident. So the intruders hardly ever won, and it was only when they were there equal or larger than the intruder or the resident. We then looked at the role of sex and were curious to see if that held a predictive pattern on the outcome. We found that winners of all combinations were made male, female, resident, intruder, and that there was really no significant difference as far as sex was concerned. However, we did find that female intruders never won against female residents. We're not sure if that has very much significance considering the low sample size we had of actual female-female interaction. So that could just be by chance. Going into the sound results, we've had a number of vibrations produced. Total calls were 172, which were divided into pulses, grunts, and tones as previously stated, in which we had 24 pulses, 134 grunts, as the majority of the vibrations being produced, and 14 tones. Residents almost always made these sounds um, because they were almost always the winner. We found that winners were very much more vocal than the intruders. Intruders made sounds a fraction of the time at 20 of the 172. There was no statistical difference in frequency between the different call types. Uh, it's important to understand that a lot of these frequencies are happening at the same level. It's really just the sound signatures as far as duration, modulation, and oscillation that differs between grunts, pulses, and tones. We also found that intruders produced calls with a higher mean peak frequency than residents. Um, it was quite significant. We're not sure yet why this is. We have a lot of different theories based on the role of size and the role as an intruder as to why the frequency would be higher in the intruders, which are very interesting. We also found a fairly intuitive relationship between peak frequency and total length slash size of the fish. As the size of the fish increases, frequency of the vibrations go down. That's fairly intuitive. We would think that as fish size increases, the sounds they produce would be deeper. That's kind of a normal um, thing you would see in nature. We also found a significant relationship between size ratio and the frequency produced of the competing fish. So as the intruder size ratio increased, so did the frequency of the calls made, which is really interesting. We're not sure yet how to explain this. Pulse trains are a very interesting sound also. We wanted to look at their duration. They were significantly longer than grunts and tones. Grunts and tones were fractions of a second, and pulse trains usually span the course of three to four, sometimes even six to seven seconds. And there's a number of pulses you can see over here. They're vertically placed with many different harmonics. We wanted to see the relationship between duration of pulses and number of pulses produced, which clearly would be a significant increase. As duration goes up, so do the number of pulses. So here are our conclusions. We found that frequency and size had an inverse relationship. As your size increased, your frequency of the vibrations produced decreased. That's fairly intuitive. However, it's unclear why the frequency size ratio relationship, as shown on the previous slide, has an opposite of the relationship of what we would expect. We're still working on that, and it continues to be a very interesting subject for debate. Dyadic contests usually favor the territorial resident, especially if it is larger. Resident fishes also reliably produced more calls. Influences of sex pairing, however, seem to have no indication on contest outcome or sound production. So a lot of really good stuff happening here for our future directions. I think we can do really well if we start looking at sound mechanisms and generating these sounds, if we start to look at maybe courtship instead of territorial disputes, and the possibility of continuing to look at different sexes. All this stuff, I'm excited to see what happens in the future. This is a very interesting animal. 
And I want to thank everyone who helped out and especially thank everyone for their interest in this presentation.